You are listening to 1252 Sports Entertainment. Parental discretion may be advised. Woo! It's about that time. Fat Mike, Chicago Sports. (laughs) Yeah. Finally here, finally here. Shot City Sports is right here. Updates on news, get it here. No rumors, cause we keep it real. Sit back, relax, check a beer one of them nights. Hey, this is Carmen DeFalco from ESPN Chicago, and you're listening to the Fat Mike Sports Show. Hey, this is Dave Richard from CBS Sports, and you're listening to the Fat Mike Chicago Sports Show. Hi, this is Jesse Rogers from the Fat Mike Chicago Sports Show. Hey, everyone, I'm Scott Merkin, the longtime White Sox beat writer for MLB.com and proud graduate of the University of Michigan. You listen to me on the Fat Mike Chicago Sports Show. This is Chuck Arvine, and you are listening to the Fat Mike Chicago Sports Show. It's the best. Hey, what's up? This is Greg Braggs Jr. from Braggs in the Stands. You're listening to my guys on the Fat Mike Chicago Sports Show. Boom! Hey everyone, it's Freddie Huebner from ESPN 1000. Great to be on the Fat Mike Chicago Sports Show. I'm Dan Zaborski, senior writer for Fangraphs, and you're listening to Fat Mike Chicago Sports Show. I'm JJ Stankovitz from NBCSportsChicago.com and the Undercenter Podcast, and you're listening to the Fat Mike Chicago Sports Show. Hey, Sparkle! You know what I listen to? It's the Fat Mike Chicago Sports Show with my guy, Fat Mike. Did you listen anywhere else? No jock. Listen to Fat Mike. Fat. Hey, what's up? And we are back. Welcome back to another episode of the Fat Mike Chicago Sports Show. Not only myself here, Fat Mike, but my co-host, my counterpart, my heterosexual life mate, Angelo Ace Camacho. God, I love this man. Look how cute he looks. This guy has the hair of 12. You can't really see it now because it's hidden behind. He looks like Teen Wolf. He looks like Teen Wolf, this guy. he I mean, this guy is just completely... He's. He's a hair monster, this guy. You're like, making like, me blush, okay? I know. I, I'm sorry, buddy. I'm sorry. But we are back, guys. And we got another big episode for you guys tonight on 1252 Sports Entertainment. Um, 1252 Sports Chicago. We got a big show for you guys. We have John Yurkovich, Green Bay Packer, Jacksonville Jaguar, but also co-host and big-time guy over at ESPN 1000, the Carmen and Yurko Show. Joining us tonight here in about uh, about ten minutes, so we got to hurry up and get to that interview. And this is what we do, man. We bring on too many guys, and we just talk sports. We're gonna try and slow this down a little bit, Angelo. I'm sorry, dude. I, don't I, uh, mean I think it. it's just funny that last week, after the show, we did our after show little spat that we do yeah. with everybody, uh-huh. and you were like, "I think from now on, if we get a guest, we're only gonna do one guest to show." Yeah. So yes. that we have time to hit a bunch of different topics, talk with our guests, blah, blah, yes. blah. Yes. Clearly, that didn't uh, no. carry over to this. No, week exactly. It did not carry over. Show lined up. And you know, I'll, I'll tell you what the problem was. The problem was that, is, you know, I fucked up. Okay. And I went drinking and yep. I hung out with Yurko. Yep. You did. And Yurko bought some shots. And I. Then in return, asked Yurko to come on the show this week. Yep. So that, that that that's exactly what happened. That's the story that unfolded last week when they did their live event over at uh, the Points Bet Sportsbook out in Crestwood. I was a I was a I was a patron. I came out there. I was like, Yeah, Carmen Yurko, baby, what's up? Mike and had then too much fun out there. I, 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 that's exactly what happened. <laughs> I put fifty dollars on Webb Simpson for the Masters. He shit the bed, guys. Just so you know, Webb Simpson is on my list with, like, the New York Jets and the New York Giants. He now falls in that category where I will, where I will never bet on that fucking guy ever again. You say that, but then you will sometime <sighs> yeah. in the next I know. I got to straighten out. Listen, Angel, I got to straighten out. This is absolutely ridiculous, dude. I don't know. I mean, listen, and we got our first fan, by the way. Did I tell you about this? I, we were you talking were, you about started it. to, but then yeah. we had to get the show started. We, so we were talking a little bit about on. it in pre-show. Yeah. We were talking a little bit about a pre-show. We have our first fan, some guy named Dill Pickles on YouTube, said that we are absolutely obnoxious and that our show sucks. 
That's so right. That's it's perfect. our first fan. All right. High My five. Love, baby. High five. Psh. All right, dude, that was awesome. Now, listen, we got our first fan, Dill Pickles. You can eat my fat, hairy, Polish asshole. Okay, that's that's what I think about that. And, you know, there you go. I'm going forward. I don't give a fuck about what you say. All right, you're one turd sandwich out of the whole bunch that, you know, listen, there's a reason why we get anywhere between seven and 12,000 downloads a week for this show, Angela. It's, you know what it is? Because, it's because, we're, we're, because you're obnoxious. Because we're fucking fun, Angelo. We are, because uh, we're fun. You're so, you're the fun. So I like to to chalk our show up. But, you know, you're kind of the Yurko of this show. Ah, come yeah, on. Oh no, yeah, you got the knowledge, you got the wit, you got the humor, and I'm calm. I'm just I'm just riding on your coattails, baby. Nah, listen, 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 listen. Karma and Yurko both know their knowledge. They both they both yeah. know what's going on, but. Listen, I'm just not afraid to call anybody out on their bullshit is sure. what it boils down to. But you know what, Dill Pickles, we're, this is where we're going to end it. You can go fuck yourself, okay? But going forward. No, I want like, him to come on. We should you know, let him fuck come this on one day. He and can eat a big bag of dicks for all I care. And I hope he chokes on him and dies. All right. But anyways, <laughs> listen, we got a big show tonight, man. We Not only yep. do we have Yurko from Carmen and Yurko coming on with us, we also have the guy Jim McMahon, the, the 1985, QB, baby. the fucking punky QB coming on with us. Super Bowl winning quarterback yep. for the 85 86 Chicago Bears joining us tonight. And it's going to be a great show, man. It's going to be fucking awesome. Yep. I cannot wait for this to happen. It's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, I can't wait, dude. Like, listen, I cannot wait to talk with Jim McMahon about, you know, like the Mike Ditka stuff. And the buddy, yeah, I'd like Ryan to get some stuff. insight on the uh, the Super Bowl, <laughs> you know, because not like we have a lot of experience with those. In yeah, this city, we so. have. I mean, you and I are you and I are young cats, man. We're I wasn't alive. I yeah, was I wasn't alive. alive either. I was swimming in my daddy's underpants at that point. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's exactly what I was doing. I wasn't even a thought. All right, and you know, like I was, I was. I'm surprised I didn't make it into a tube sock. Oh you know what I mean? God. So like. This is. I'm ready to get going. I'm ready to pound fucking sand and talk to Jim McMahon. That's what I'm ready to do. Yeah. I want to ask him about Zach Wilson in this upcoming draft. I want to ask him about what's going on with the, this current Bears team and how he feels about that. I and want to ask him why the headband didn't work for Mitch. Right. Exactly. Mitch wore it at exactly. Year and it just it didn't work. He sucks. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're not going to listen. We're past the Mitch age. We're You're right. done. We're You're out right. of it. We're not going to die. It's April 1st. No more Mitch. All right. Yeah. No more Mitch. No more Mitch, dude. I don't want to talk about Mitch Trubisky anymore. All right. Uh, he's gone. He's done. Everything's good to go. It, it's it's a done deal. And he is out of Chicago. So, I mean, I'm excited for this, Angela. I'm pumped, man. But we got a lot of other stuff to dive into, man. We got the Cubs and White Sox. And today on ESPN 1000 was a big deal talking about the Cubs and White Sox. And I'm pumped up about this because you, you know me. I'm a Cub fan. I know that you're a Cub fan. And I, listen, I'm not happy with my Cubs right now, man. I'm not happy with them. They don't fucking hit. They're plain and simple, they do not hit. I have seen they couldn't hit water if they fell out of a fucking boat. Plain and simple. This are, team uh, is is it, it, it it's trash, man. They don't hit plain and simple. Yeah, it's uh it's ridiculous. They for like we talked last week, the the longest time we we were like, oh, it's it, they'll come out of it. It's the name on the back of the baseball card. It's this is the reason this year. This is the reason that year. It'll change. It'll change, and it hasn't. They didn't even hit that well in 2016 in the in the world uh, the playoff run. We talked about that last week. Right. There were still games where they went. The bats were just dead. Um, so this has just been an issue for five, six years. And and it's I, I don't think there is any way to fix it at this point except get rid of half this team. Uh guys like I mean Javi Baez, what has he done all year? Zero. Right. Right. Chris Bryant, yeah. what has he done all year? Zero. Rizzo right. wants a contract extension, right? And his numbers are trash too. Like you got you got guys that are just completely floundering at the at the at the plate and there's no there's no sign of it changing anytime soon 
Right. The, the, this Chicago Cubs team, man, it drives me absolutely nuts. It really does. I mean, the, the, what if 10 games, 49 hits? You've got to be fucking kidding me, dude. My it's seven-year-old's cool. baseball team hits it is, than that. Yeah, you ain't fucking joking. A Little League <laughs> team in Mustang manages more hits than yeah. 49 in 10 games, dude. I mean, this is the shit that drives me nuts about this team. And it's over and over every single year, and it's been that way since 2016, 2017. 2018, we finally had Theo Epstein come out and say, listen, our offense is broken. Yep. All right. All right. And nothing has changed since then. They still have not found a, a decent leadoff hitter. Nope. They still have not found, I mean, anybody in this lineup. And we're, we're bringing on our guy right now, our guy from ESPN 1000. Our guy, he, he, we're gonna we're gonna touch a lot of base with this with him tonight. We're gonna we're There's gonna only touch one Cubs. bright spot with this Chicago Cubs team right now, and we, Listen, we'll talk about that in a little bit. This, and we're ta- we're we're bringing him on right now. He got me way too drunk the other night, and it's all his fault. I blame I blame Johnny. I blame the good kid. It's all his fault. All right, and hopefully he does the mop for us tonight. Let's see if he does it for us. And uh, he, he's my guy, John John the good kid Yurkovich, baby. He's our guy. Let's bring him on right now. Here he is. Boom. Johnny, do the mop, the mop. baby. There it is. No, do, do I don't the mop, buddy. You were doing it, but I don't. I can't get the legs in it. You guys, <laughs> without the legs and the motion of the legs for the mop, you don't even really know what the hell's going on. So you got to have the legs for the mop. You got you to have that ass for it, buddy. You right, first have of all, first of all, I was listening to you guys for the last couple of minutes, and you guys are like, uh, nobody's done nothing. Let, let's, this is the team that's going to go the rest of this campaign. This is the team. There's nobody on the bench that's going to replace anybody. Right. This is it. It's Rizzo. It's Brian. It, it, you know, it, it's Contreras. It's Hap. This is your team, whether you like it or not. Two games under 500. I, hey, this is the way it's going to be. Love them or leave them or hate them or whatever. It doesn't make a difference. They're not selling out Wrigley Field because they can't. They're not allowing it. Right. You know, there's still yeah. going to be 8,200 people coming to the ballpark. There's going to be busloads coming in from Iowa. And busloads coming in from Kankakee and Champagne. And they're going to come in there and they say, whoa, look at this. Big, tall buildings. Wow. Hey, Wrigleyville. Woo. And that's what you're going to get. That's what you're going to have. Now, are they going to have to go ahead and blow this whole thing up? They might have to. But up until they do blow it up, these are our guys. And uh, whether you like it or not, this is uh, this is what you had. This is the hand that you've been dealt. you got to play it. Two nine offsuited. Yeah, that's right. a terrible hand to go into any yeah. uh, any any start with. But here's the thing: is like, even if they blew it up, what are they really going to get for any of these guys at this well, point? Oh yeah, listen, what you're getting is minor leaguers. You're getting prospects. Right. You're getting pitchers. You're getting some flamethrowers. You're getting somebody that's not working for somebody, and maybe a change of address and a change of venue turns somebody into a player. That's all you can hope for. And you know, I hope Bryant continues to hit well, continues to do what he needs to do. Then maybe you turn him into something. I listen, in my heart of hearts, as a Cubs fan, I'd love to see this team get on a little bit of a roll and do something. And I've got the perfect tonic. What does this team love? Cincinnati. The, all of the great American Cincinnati, ballpark. Cincinnati, all 162. The great games. American ballpark where you get the, the 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 winds blowing through the power alleys, and all of a sudden everybody's hitting better than everybody. What they need is a nice 12 game set in Cincinnati. <laughs> 12 games. When does that start? <laughs> if they can do that and get the schedule makers to agree for them to get out to Cincinnati, I think the whole world's going to be happy. <laughs> I mean, that's it, right? Yeah. I'm try- I'm at least thinking positively. I'm trying to find a place they all hit well, where they score runs. And the only place I know where they do that is in Cincinnati. So, Yurko, Yurko today you you and the guys on ESPN 1000 on your show, Carmen and Yurko, it was a big thing today with the Cubs and White Sox. And both teams aren't playing up to caliber as, as in the first – you know, 12, 15 games yeah. here. At the, at they've the stumbled of the out of the gate. Stumbled right, out of they've the stumbled gate. out of the gate. Exactly. That's the best way to put it. All right. Right now, the Cubs are five and six. And just like the last four years, they still can't seem to manage to hit the ball. Five and How seven can, now. Five and seven. Exactly. You're yeah, right. You are 100% today. correct. How can our Chicago Cubs – Fix this. Where, where do the Cubs come up to this, and how do they fix this? Besides, so playing, of these besides playing Cincinnati. 
for no, a okay, so you can't play Cincinnati 12 games in a row in Cincinnati. How about this? How about we go oppo day? We back Explain. the other direction. Just back the other direction. Ian Happ goes righties against righties, lefties against lefties. Change it up. Chris Bryant goes from the left-handed side of the plate. Rizzo switches it around. I, I'll be honest with you. Javi Baez can't look any more pitiful against the curveball in the dirt left-handed than he is right-handed. I have never seen a guy twice in the last three games swing at a pitch. One was 57 feet in front of the plate. The other one was uh, 57 feet outside, you know, down and away. And where's Javi's bat? Through the zone. Through the zone, like he's going to make a connection. He's four and a half, six feet away from the ball. But here he is, Baez, predetermined swing. Woo! Through the strike zone. And look, I thought he was playing cricket. I thought he was protecting the wicket behind him. Honest to God, you don't swing at balls in the dirt. Only Englishmen do to protect their wicket, okay? I don't know if this guy's confused. I don't know if maybe when he was in the U.S. Virgin Islands, he played a little bit of cricket, and it's kind of reverting back into his brain and the occipital lobe back here, and all of a sudden it's triggering him to go ahead and swing. I don't get it. I don't understand. But I turn him around. Everybody turn around and swing the other direction. Why not? I, I mean, at this point, right, at this point it can't get worse. It, it can't be worse what they're doing now. Whatever they're doing now, it can't be worse. There is one bright side, I guess, is how Craig Kimbrell's been pitching, right? We we all right, thought right. that was when just going to be a complete closer, catastrophe. When, right. When you needed the closure last year, he was nowhere to be found. Right. So now in a, a stinking pile of poo-poo, the one piece that smells good is Kimbrell. Oh, okay. All right. Well, okay. I, I Listen, you're right. It is positive. Kimbrell has pitched well. I think the relief, uh, except who is that? Son of Cypher. Well, who's the guy the other night? Cypher? Yeah. That guy, the way yeah, he pitched, yeah. gave up six runs. You know, I guess, again, except for him, I, the bullpen has done an all right job. They've done an all right job. So, so, so what? They all got to be pulling on the same side of the rope. And right now, they're not all pulling on the same side of the rope. And the hitting is abysmal. I don't blame the pitching coach. I don't even know who the – Iacopa. Who is it? Lee Iacocca? <laughs> Yeah. If somebody gets Lee Iacocca out of the Ford boardroom or Chrysler boardroom and gets him down and works with the hitters, I'd be happy. Go, go ahead. Give him some advice. I don't know what the hell is Iacocca going to do. <laughs> What's the guy's <laughs> name? Ian Choppy? What's his name? Angelo, do, do I'm, I'm going to look it up real quick. Yeah, I think the guy's name is like uh, Iapochi or something like that. Yeah. Iacocca, Iapochi. It doesn't make a difference when the guys aren't hitting. Ultimately, they're going to blame him, right? They right. blame Maley, Chili Davis, the poor guy, can't even get a job no more. The Cubs are so rotten with him that uh, he can't even get a gig no more. So the, you were just you were just bringing up the pitching staff. This pitching staff yeah. in the Chicago Cubs seems to be clones of all the same guy. Yeah. Righty, lefty, yeah. it doesn't matter. Whoever they are, they fire off at 90 to 93 miles an hour. Is this a problem with the Chicago Cubs team, or can well, they win with these guys? I think it's the least of their problems. I, I think right now the pitching is the least of their problems. Uh, and, and if you take a look at their pitching, you know, they've given up a couple seven runs. Um, you know, they've given up, uh, I think, six runs. This team can't score. You can't score. You can't win. That's just the way it is. It doesn't matter right. what your pitcher is going to do. You've got to be able to score. Take a look at their run production compared to the rest of the uh, Major League Baseball. Look at their run production. The only thing that's really keeping them in it is the starting pitching, you know? Right. That's what's kept them in it so far. Their, their negative balance on runs scored against runs against isn't as bad. But if you look at their runs scored compared to the rest of the league, it's pitiful. It, it's absolutely shameful. And, you know, what's it going to take? Warmer weather? I, let, let's hope Tracy Butler works some magic with Mother Nature. And, and, <laughs> and, and the ghost of Jerry Taft comes back out and, and helps warm things up. And the, the skinny guy now, WGN. Did you just does. say the ghost of Jerry the Taft? The ghost of Jerry Taft. And the skinny guy now. I, I Give me the lost weight of Tom Skilling. And with the ghost of Jerry Taft and Tracy Butler and combine all three. And let's work a little bit of mojo with that, you know? Woo, mojo, mojo, mojo. Let's work with all of it and make it happen. I mean, I, I hope the warmer weather is going to make it better. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, but like Mike and I have talked the last couple of weeks, this team has struggled for years. It's everywhere. Right? Right, everywhere. It, it, even in 2016, right. during the playoff run, they still right. had games where the bats would go completely dead, right. and it they have. It's always been somebody else's fault. It was Chili Davis, and then it was Joe Man. Madden, and then it was you yeah. know COVID, and now it's well, the same bullshit. Right, Angela. Listen, it's always going to be the same. Okay, it's always the same. No matter whether you like it or not, it's always going to be the player's fault. It, it, it up to, it's up to the players to perform. If the players don't perform, it's not going to make a difference. Right. The coaches and the management and everybody else, they're sacrificial lambs from what's not being done on the field. So I, I'm not a coach killer. I, I won't blame a coach unless the coach is making mistakes. I mean, grotesque mistakes. Then I'll go ahead and blame the coach. But I will not blame a coach uh, in this situation. It's players. They got to get their heads out of their asses. They got to play for each other. Yeah. For each other, they got to play. So, if, so they don't, if they don't get that, they're the only ones that can make each other successful. They, so as a team, have to come together and make each other successful. Yerk, there's, there's a ton of talk around town. I've been listening to you guys all week. You guys are obviously, again, we're hanging out with John Yerkovich from the Carmen and Yerker Show from ESPN 1000 Chicago. But there's been a lot of talk around town across the uh, across the broadcast over there at ESPN 1000 about who should the Cubs should offer a contract to, whether it be Rizzo, Baez, Bryant, so on and so forth. I get it. Those are supposed to be the big names on the Cubs. Right. But in your opinion, who should they sign to a contract, if any? Uh, right now, I would say no one. Let them prove it. Let's go out. And listen, the better they play, the easier they are to trade. Uh, like, you can't revamp this thing by keeping people around. It's not right. the way it works. Whoever your best three, four players are are the guys that got to get that got to get traded. Then you got to hit rock bottom. And you got to stay there for a couple of years, the way Houston did. Houston was down there. They won 54 in like 56 games for a couple of years in a row. You got to stink. You got to get a top two, top three draft choice. You've got to bring them in, and you've got to go about the business of becoming a better team. You can't halfway rebuild. You can't rebuild on the fly. This is not the Boston Red Sox anymore, boys. It's right. not going to happen. 04, 07, 0, whenever. It's not going to happen. This is not the Red Sox. Theo bailed. Theo was smart enough to get the hell out of Dodge. He looked at it. He looked at the, the Ricketts hemorrhaging cash uh, with a tremendous debt load that they've got to meet every single day. And he said, yeah, it's not going to happen here no more. I'm getting out of Dodge. And then he left Jed Hoyer. He said, you can have it. It's yours. I don't want it no more. So Jed's here trying to figure out. And who's the third guy? McLeod, the guy with the cowboy hat. And McLeod's the guy that's here, you know. Peter they, Francis they wanted, Tracy. They wanted to blame him a couple of years ago. It was McLeod's fault. No, so they've inherited the players. If they're if they're not going to win, this team's not going to win the way it is. Then none of them are. Nobody's a sacred cow that gets to stick around. They all got to go. Thank you for the memories. Hasta la bye bye, la noche. Have a good life. So, uh, Angela, you got anything more on the Cubs, man? No, the Cubs. Like, pissed. I feel like yeah. we always get pissed off I'm at every struggled. team. Right. Talk I'm just gonna, let's I'm talk just about the team out. that's. Hey, let's talk about the team that's more disappointing in this city. It's the Chicago <laughs> White Sox. Right now, exactly like you just said. Now into the White Sox here. The White Sox stars have been unreal to say the least. It's been what everybody thought as their strong point of the team, giving up the games with the bullpen. Yeah, the bullpen. And, and do you think the White Sox can right the ship here and get this bullpen in order, yes. Yurko? Yes. Ultimately, talent comes to the top. They're going to get Tim Anderson here back shortly. I think Tim Anderson is an important cog in this, in this wheel that they've got going on. Um, you know, the injury to 74 really kind of hurt them. But the, I don't think – That's the in the nets, right? Yeah. I don't think 74 yeah. – would have gotten off to a better start than the Mercedes has gotten off to, the SL800. I mean, this guy has been absolutely fantastic. So, I mean, even with like, okay, we're going to miss uh, Jimenez, doesn't matter because the Mercedes has come out and has been absolutely fantastic. So this team is too good to continue to struggle for an extended period of time. I expect the White Sox to turn things around. I expect the schedule to get a little bit softer for them. I think they're starting pitching. 
has been absolutely fantastic. Right now, they're finding ways to lose games in the seventh and eighth inning. I think ultimately they turn this thing around. If I had to choose which side of town is going to recover quickly, it would be the White Sox. The White Sox more than the other. But it's fun to go ahead and make fun of White Sox, uh, the White Sox and White Sox fans, because they're as bad as the Cubs are right now. So you might as well go ahead and have fun with them and make fun of them. They deserve it. They're White Sox fans. They deserve to get made fun of. I, like you just alluded to Tim Anderson and obviously Eloy Jimenez are hurt and this team is still keeping up relatively pretty good keeping them in the game uh but with the lineups La Russa is treading out there it seems to a little out of the realm of what major league baseball lineups look like wow. so how how far so so far how do you think La Russa is done with this roster that he's putting together and trekking out there each and every single game a bullpen that fails will make a manager look bad. So the bullpen has failed. It's made the manager look bad at times. Uh, with those two kids that started, the two guys, the journeymen, whatever you want to call them that started the other day, whether you like it or not, 12 games into a season, you've got to find that bats for people. You've got to, you can't have a guy go 12 days without batting. Right. It's not going to work. I don't care how good the players you have. The, you've got to go ahead and spell a guy, put a guy in. This is a 162-game marathon, okay? You can't have knee-jerk reactions after 11, 12 games. I'm sorry. I won't do it. Uh, I wish the bullpen was better. If the bullpen was better, Tony La Russa looked like a genius. They'd be 9-2. and two. They might end up, uh, you know, they play their 12th game tonight or they play their 13th game tonight. Either way, they look a lot better. They look like the American League uh, version of the Dodgers than they do right now, a team that's muddling, a team that's in last place, trying to figure out if their bullpen's going to uh, show up and uh, be good. So if we got a question from the chat from our guy, uh, Andrew Tarbill. Mm -hmm. Are the White Sox better with Tony La Russa? Yeah, I think they're fine with Tony La Russa. Tony La Russa is La Russa's not the problem. Effective bullpen is your dilemma, and nobody thought the bullpen would be the issue this year. And early on, it has been the uh, the issue. I look for them to write themselves and not be an issue as we, as they start moving forward. Yerk, who do you think has to step up for this White Sox team? While like guys like Tim Anderson, he's coming back. Hopefully, uh, what they say Thursday tomorrow. So uh, who who's somebody that can kind of jump up and and be on that same level as Tim Anderson to help you know maybe produce a little bit more. At the plate uh, who, or somebody in the, the pitching kid, staff. Uh, who's the kid in the ninth inning uh, last night that uh, didn't play well? Crochet? Uh, not not Robert. Uh, the other one. Uh, Ivan. Is it Ivan? What's his name? Uh, Come on, guys. Help me out. Uh, hold on, he came to me. He came to I'm bat. a Cub fan, Yerk. I'm a Man, Cub fan. Moncada, guys. Moncada. Oh, yeah, Moncada. Moncada came up. He's got to be better. So that's yeah. the guy you asked me who's got to be better. Moncada's got to be better. Last night, um, uh, Aribe missed the pitch, right? Is that his name? Yeah. Abreu. Abreu. Abreu missed the pitch last night. Okay, the first baseman. Abreu misses, misses a pitch last night, and they said it. If Abreu's on, he doesn't miss that pitch. It was a mistake. It was a hanger. It was on the inner third of the plate. And usually Abreu's knocking that mistake out in the left field, you know, right. up into that, where the kiddies play up top. Some poor kid was going to have a concussion last night if he caught that ball, right? But instead, he misses it. It's it's a strike. He gets to first base. He eventually walks. But that would have been a home run. That game would have been over. White Sox are celebrating. There's fireworks going off. A little light show that everybody's enamored with. Hey, the Blackhawks have been doing it for 10, 15 years, all right? Now you get some lights, and the people at Comiskey Park are, going, are guaranteed raid. Go, woo, luck, woo, it's a light show. We're absolutely fascinated. So uh, Abreu could do better. Mankata can do a little bit better. Um, Madrigal, the second baseman, when he does play, please field your position. They're not going to ask much of you. Just go ahead and field the position and have a good time. So, so uh, your last night, why, I was sitting here at the house here just, you know, doing my own thing. Chilling. Chilling, doing my own thing, kicking back a few cold ones, doing my uh -huh. thing. But last night watching the White Sox, it actually felt like watching a baseball game. A masterful pitching performance oh, yeah. 
between Shane Bieber and Lucas Giolito. And all throughout baseball, it has taken a decline in the ratings. We all know that, okay? The ratings are down. They're trying to get youth involved, yada, yada, yada. Right, yeah. And I was super happy in watching that pitching performance because you don't see that too much anymore. How do you feel about last night's rubber match between Shane Bieber and Lucas Giolito? Well, I was excited because I knew it was going to be a well-pitched game. And it was a well-pitched game. Damn so right it was. It like was. playoff baseball. To me, that reminds me a little bit of playoff baseball. Yeah. Now, I won't, I, I'm not going to lie to you guys. Baseball is boring. It's just the truth. Baseball is boring. I watched Real Madrid today play Liverpool in Anfield to a 0-0 draw. Okay? 94 minutes. 0-0 draw. 50 times more exciting than a baseball game. It's just the truth. All right? Baseball's got a problem. It's slow like molasses. Okay? That's what it is on a winter's day, not on a hot summer day where it's running down the tree. I'm talking about on a winter day where it barely breaks the bark and just kind of millimeter by millimeter goes down. Baseball's a boring game. And the way they play it now, it's even more boring. No hit and runs, no stealing bases, no movement on the infield. All this crap with shifting guys all over God's green earth, and nobody wants to lay a bunt down the third base line when they can automatically get on base. Everybody telling me how important walks are. Walks are important. Yurko, walks. Oh my God, walks are important. Why won't you bunt down the third base line if it's going to be an automatic hit? Hit, walk. Same crap. You're on first base, right? right. But nobody's willing to do it. Do you know how difficult it is to hit the opposite side when they're pitching you inside? Develop. Some skills. That's what it's called. Yep. Develop some skills. Be willing to sacrifice for your team so you don't hit one of your 20 homers for the year in the 600 at bats that you're going to get. For the love of God, man, put the barrel of the bat on the ball, push it down the third baseline, and go stand on first base like a gentleman. Now, what could Major League Baseball do? I know, obviously, like you just said, the players should, you know, I don't do want some major, stuff. But. I don't want a hey, ace. I don't want Major League Baseball interfering. The last thing you need is corporate baseball. You already seen some of the moves they made. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't need corporate baseball interfering with managers who should manage the game. I don't. I don't. I don't need limitations. This isn't basketball. I can't play a one-three-one zone. Diamond and one. Oh, you can't do that. Ooh, we can't do that. No. Let the managers manage. If I want to put 14 guys next to the first baseman and you're dumb enough not to hit away from the first baseman, then what am I supposed to do with you? What am I going to do with you? That's true. You're obstinate. What you got to do is be flexible. Area. So, so, so your girl. I got a I got a question to ask you. You keep on saying on ESPN one thousand. I had a I had a listener of our show come on here at, and ask me. I'm not going to drop names, but this specific listener wants to know if you're a single and ready to mingle, bro. Oh yeah, I've seen that on Twitter. Listen, <laughs> listen, my head's always on a swivel, boys. You got to know that there does happen to be a young lady that has taken up a, a lot more time than in oh. the past. There you oh. go. That's being fair. Being fair. <laughs> there is a young lady, and I'm, I'm going to – I'm heading down to Florida with her to celebrate her birthday. You know what I'm saying? There you go. There you go. Johnny the blue good shoes kid. are coming out in full force. <laughs> Johnny good kid, you dirty, yeah. dirty son of a hey, bitch. Hey, I got it all. The blue shoes, the three chi, you got it. That's right. <laughs> Delta A, cannabinoids. Boom. This guy's a machine over here. <laughs> got to kill the pain. The hips, they don't swivel like they used to. <laughs> so last question about baseball here before we bring up football, Yerk. I know that you got John, John Yerkovich – football expert on your thing. I want to ask you one more quick question about baseball. I'm ready. I, I know it's early and I know it's crazy to make predictions at this point in time, but as it sits right now, okay, do you think the Cubs will even make the playoffs 
And do you think the Sox will win their division? I think because the Sox those win big, their yeah, those I are the they, big predictions at the beginning right. of the season. So I think the Sox win the division. Okay. I had the I had the Cubs winning 88 games. Okay, 88. That's the number I gave them. 88. I got the White Sox up at 94. I think 94 wins the AL Central. I think 88 wins the uh, uh, the NL Central. So yeah, I have both. But if there's a fire sale and these guys don't prove they should be a team together, and there's a fire sale, then that number ends up going probably to about 82, maybe 81. So right. I think the White Sox are going to do it. They're going to win their division. I'm going to make fun of them while I can because they're going to end up the cream rises to the top. Those guys are going to end up winning games and winning the division. Meanwhile, you know, I I, I just want double-digit runs. I, I just want a 10-run game. I don't care if you lose 12-10. Just give me double-digit runs. I want to see an offensive barrage. You know, I mean, uh, I, mean I take five hits at this point. In a so, game. Hey, listen, <laughs> I'm waiting. Uh, when we go to Cincinnati, man, I am going to start betting overs for the Chicago Cubs. <laughs> so if the, if the Cubs don't make the playoffs and the, if the White Sox don't win their division, is it a failure on both sides of town? Well, if the White Sox don't make the playoffs, that is, that, that's yeah. a backsliding move. That's a back step. Because uh, they were on a pace last year to win about 93 games. And I'm not asking them to win more than 93. That's about the number, 93, 94. So, yeah, that would be a, a, a problem for the Chicago White Sox. They did not play as well as they did last year. And remember, they were miserable at the end of last year to where they only extrapolated the numbers out and they'd end up being at about 93 victories. So, yeah. Listen, I'm worried about the Cubs. If these guys don't start playing for each other, I'm worried about the Cubs. That's a legitimate concern. Um, could they do it? Should they do it? Maybe, maybe. Um, that's why I hope they at least play well, where if they start moving these guys off the team, you get something back. Right. That's the only hope at this point. You know what I mean? It's, <laughs> well, if they don't hit, if they right. don't hit, that's the only hope. Right. It's too early though to draw conclusions. As, so- uh, in, in hunt for the red October, when, uh, when he was going into the meeting and they asked him a direct question, Alex Haley. They asked him a direct question. They said, uh, uh, you know, what are your thoughts on this? He goes, it's too early to draw conclusions. <laughs> and I believe it is too early to draw conclusions right now. So just, I'll be patient. Middle of May, Mother's Day. I'll know more on Mother's Day than I will now. <laughs> so, so now to move on a little bit from baseball here, good kid. We have a we have to talk some Chicago Bears here. You know we have our we have, we have to we have yeah oh. man we have to we have to talk Chicago Bears did we football. Lose, did we lose we have we Bears? have the Mister we have Mister Punky QB coming on tonight right I, after you John Jerko former I, teammate of mine in Green Bay I'll have you exactly know. former teammate of yours down up there in Green Bay and he's actually he's actually hanging out patiently in the waiting room right now. Oh, uh, but he's a handsome fella. He's a handsome fella. So you know what? I'm going to tell you this. Hold on. This is a little something about Jimmy Mack. You guys may not know. Go right ahead. Very comfortable naked. Very, <laughs> very you know, comfortable naked. I, I'm telling you that right now. And uh, one of the finest cribbage players I've ever had the uh, the pleasure of playing against. So, I love man, me some cribbage. Naked a- cribbage with Jim McMahon in the Green Bay locker room is one of my highlights of my career. <laughs> so at, at this point, I feel like I should just bring him on to join Yurko, Angela. What do, you think, what do you think? Yeah, let Yurko we'll say hi. All right. Let, 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 let's bring on Jim. Jim Jim McMahon, I heard you're a, a, a wonderful man naked, I, I guess. How's it going, bud? Well, naked I'm, cribbage I'm player. Comfortable. I'm a comfortable man naked. You're, you're very comfortable. comfortable. Man naked. Th- this interview went very sideways very, very fast. <laughs> so uh, thanks thanks a lot, Yerk. I appreciate yeah. it, bud. I Hey, appreciate nobody it. goes 15-2, 15-4, 15-6, 15-8, and straight eight for 16. I'm like, sweet <laughs> heavens, I'm getting skunked here for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> Luck of the draw, kid. Luck of the draw. It's some, is it? And it's the it's when you put the card over, it even gets better for Jimmy. <laughs> this uh, this 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 show just took a took a sidestep, way for the worst. But you know what? I'm loving it, Angela. I love I'm it. Loving. Yeah, absolutely for sure. So now, when do we so get to we... talk cribbage with Yurko and, and Jim McMahon? I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know what the hell cribbage is at this point. Oh, like, I, I had to learn that game up in Minnesota. Uh, our trainer said I couldn't get any treatment until I learned the game of cribbage. So I was 
I, uh, every night I was up in the boys' rooms watching them play, and they all cheat, so it was hard to learn because they cheat their ass off. And, uh, yeah, I, I got it figured out. So I'll I'll bring you both in on 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 uh, the baseball. The, the, I'm sorry, the baseball, the football stuff that we got going on. So we we have to talk about our Chicago Bears here. Let's get both your guys' insight. Um, we know that you know with the draft coming up here in about t- a little over two weeks, a ton of talk about what the Bears should do. How do you think the Bears should draft, and what position do you think? raises their biggest need jim i'll let you go first and then yerk i'll let you go next yeah i'll be quick because i don't even know i don't watch them don't care so oh sweet peace i, okay. I wouldn't know i wouldn't know what they need or who they're gonna think of drafting so all right so ahead, I'll, I'll take i'll take over from there and that was always jimmy's attitude by the way we've interviewed jimmy a number of different times and <laughs> we've got the same answer out of him on the very specific questions like that Offensive tackle, I take care of the offensive line. You've got to protect the quarterback, whether you like it or not. I'd also like to give him weapons that he'd be able to go ahead and utilize. So offensive line, wide receiver, and I think they're in a position where they're getting Goldman back that uh, if they wanted to address uh, a corner for depth in the future and quarterback, I think you should draft the quarterback every single year. Um, Whether it's in the second, third, fifth, seventh, doesn't make a difference. Kurt Warner came to the Packers as a free agent, wasn't quite ready to play yet, took him five years, and he became an NFL player. But you always got to have an eye out for quarterback talent, and you can never invite too many quarterbacks to camp. So you guys, uh, not to, not to kind of cut kind of cut this 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 dress short, but you guys played together up in Green Bay. What was that like? What was that like playing with one another? How was that cool? Well, I didn't play much, so I, I had a lot more fun than, than Yurko did. Uh, he had a lot of fun, but uh, like I said, it's camaraderie in the locker room. Then, yeah, you we, know, did, that's we did have commit. a good time. It, a lot of good yeah. guys up there. A great, uh, great atmosphere. The, it was the best team or the best organization that that I played for in the of the seven teams that I got to play for. Yeah, the we had, Green we, Bay. We, pa- oh, hold on, hold on, time out, time out, really quick. The Green Bay Packers were the best organization you've ever played with. By far, oh, yeah. yeah. From top to bottom, just great people. Uh, that breaks know, my the, heart, Jim. That breaks my guys, heart. All the way up to the, you know, the whoever's the the main guy up there right now. Who knows? But right, yeah. Everybody I mean, Pepper, gets treated the same, and uh, yeah. they treat you great up there. Back then, yeah. it was Pepper Burris, uh, you know, and the Red Batty was your equipment guy. Right. Pepper was your trainer. Yeah, and he said it. Back then, it was Bob Harlan, uh, who was the president of the Packers. Uh, Mike Reinfeldt was there. Everybody, Ted Thompson, everybody was fantastic up there. And uh, the camaraderie they had in the locker room, Jimmy got the bonus year where he ended up winning the Super Bowl with those guys also. So that was a team that uh, they brought some players in, solidified some positions. The next thing you know, their defense was one of the best in the league and their offense was one of the best in the league. And you're the only show in town. People love you. No matter where you go, you're the best, you're the greatest, you're fantastic. And if you've never been in that type of atmosphere – well, you're not sharing with a hockey team. You're not sharing with a basketball team. You're not sharing with baseball teams. You are the show, the only show, and they treat you like you are a king up there. So is Mark. Uh, don't forget ice fishing. That's pretty big up there. Yeah. Oh, boy. I'm telling you. Chicken oh. booyah. What, what are you guys fishing up there for? Walleyes? Booyah. You guys doing some walleyes up there ice fishing? What are you guys doing up there? Uh, I'd go spear them with the Indians. They had a special spearing season in the spring. Where uh, only the Lac du Flambeau up in the flowage, only the American Indians could fish up there. And let me tell you, woo, that's the way to fish, boys. You spear some fish, you're having some good times up there. <laughs> well, I, I live in Wisconsin. I live in Oshkosh, which is uh, what, like 45 you know minutes at, from it, Green Bay. Yeah, just so, north of Fond du Lac. Yeah, up there. just north of Fond du Lac. Close yep, to and, Lake Winnicani and Lake Poygan up there. Yep, yep. And, and you guys are right. When the Packers are as good as they have been lately, the, the Bucks don't matter. The Brewers don't matter. It's it, this is a complete. The, the state turns to cheese. You know, every, all year long. That's all it is up here. And so does my underwear. <laughs> <laughs> it turns to cheese too. Sorry, guys. I <laughs> no, Sorry, that's. I I'm sorry. No, that's awesome. That that that's great stuff. So, okay, you both you guys spent some time up in Green Bay. Obviously, Jim, you won a 
Well, there was a championship ring up there involved up there in Green Bay, and you wore a Bears jersey. I was I wanted to ask that question. Yeah, you wore a Bears jersey during the, during the visit at the White House stuff. Uh, what was the reason for you wearing a Bears jersey? Well, I, the reason I told all my teammates and the, uh, the the coaches was we didn't get to go back when we won. You know, we never got to, to make the visit to the White House. Uh, the space shuttle blew up a couple of days after we won, and, you know, all the focus went there, which is rightfully so. But I think they could have snuck us in, you know, in those 30 years somewhere. But uh, they never did. And so, you know, that's what I, I told all my teammates. Look, I'm going to bring my jersey. I said, we, you know, I had to explain it to them because some of these guys were in junior high when we won, right. we won in Chicago. So uh, they had no idea about the space shuttle or anything else. But uh, I explained it to them. None of them had a problem with it. Uh, Fritz Shermer, who, are, who was our defensive coordinator, he was a little pissed off, but I, I so figured it so out. He, he was uh, he was mad because it was the Rams. He was with the Rams, and we beat him to go to the go to Super Bowl in '85. That's why that's he right. was mad. it brought it brought bad memories back to him. I think that's why. So so, so obviously the, the Bears made it obvious that uh, it, it, to, to to revert from that championship that championship season with Green Bay. The Bears made it obvious that Dalton is their QB one. I know that both of you guys have sounded off on on Twitter about this, especially the Bears have made it obvious that Andy Dalton is their QB one. And as and as I as as ashamed as I am to admit it, I kind of like the signing of Andy Dalton. But do you think the Bears would be in a better situation with Mitchell Trubisky rather than Andy Dalton? I'll, I'll let your coach take care of this because, like I said, I don't, I don't follow yeah. it. All right. All right. So, listen, the reason Jimmy was successful and the reason most quarterbacks are successful is because they can go through a progression of reads and get the football where it needs to be. Sometimes that progression of reads happens pre-snap where you take a look and you see the coverage, you identify it, and you know where the football needs to go. Okay? That's where it should happen all the time. But. Right. And then sometimes they're shifting on you. You see that shift, and then you realize, okay, that ball can't go where I wanted it to. Now it's got to go to a different direction. The fatal flaw with Mitch Trubisky was there was a delay in the process of where he saw what he needed to do, and then he actually did what he needed to do. And even if that is just a millisecond or it's that much, sometimes it was too late. Not only that, but sometimes it made him reluctant to go to where he needed to go. And it was the reluctance to make the throw that needed to be made that caused him problems. He can be a guy that plays for 17 years. He could be a guy that comes in in a pinch and is a backup quarterback for an extended period of time. His career is not over. He could play in the NFL. The problem is, can you win a championship with him? That's where the dilemma comes. He can play in the NFL. He can be a backup. Nothing wrong with it. When he gets in, he can be successful. But if he's got to start for 16 games and lead you through the playoffs, that's where your problems start. So let so, me ask a question real quick. Uh, Jim, we, we all know that you took a pretty ma massive hit uh, from the Green Bay Packers during your time with the Bears. Charles Martin. Right. And, and Mitch also took a, a pretty, well, I wouldn't say a big hit, but it ended up injuring him, uh, what was that, two years ago? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, two seasons ago. It, it, he seemed hesitant to run the ball after that. Is that, you know, something that really would, would affect his decision making that much to just take off and run? You know, taking a hit like that, injuring his shoulder, or is he just, did they tell him, hey, don't run the ball as much as you used to? Well, I would guess that they told him not to run much, you know, get rid of it rather than run. But that running, it's a, it's a reactionary thing. I mean, you don't, you don't plan to do it. I mean, I never just plan, hey, I'm going to run. That wasn't the fastest guy in the world. But when, when the, the seas part, sometimes, you know, they start doing stunts up front, and they, you, you just see a wide open lane. You take it because you can't, you know, you, it's not going to be open for very long. Right. Especially if the secondaries in the man coverage, their backs are turned, they're in trail techniques then you can go ahead and get a chunk of yardage. But usually it's a decision of last resort that, okay, things are breaking down around me. I see some space, and then I'm going to go ahead and take off. But nobody wants to take the extra pounding. And now they protect quarterback. Jim, imagine if you were protected the way they're protected now. Wow. You, never, you, could have played, you could have played for 40 years, for heaven's sake. <laughs> well, I would I would have loved to be playing in the offenses they have now. Everything's spread yeah. out. And, oh, yeah. I mean, that's, that's the easiest – 
those are the easiest kind to pick apart. I mean, if somebody on the defense is going to give something away. And if you pay attention at all in your, in your meetings or your film sessions or just, just body language, just watching guys, look them in the eyes. I mean, you can tell what the hell they're doing. And players are creatures of habit. Players oh, line yeah. up where they want to cheat a little bit. Players line up because they know they need to get someplace. And if you're an astute watcher of the game or the film, and we watch too much film the way I always thought it was. It was way too uh, – watched a ton of film. But that film is where you picked up all those little nuances that gave you all the reads that you needed to go out there and be successful. Correct. So so with both you guys being former NFL NFL NFLers yourself, okay, how Three do you – Three NFLs, wow. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. I'm stuttering here. I got a stuttering problem, Yurko. Jeez, sweet Pete, leave me alone. All right. With both you guys being former NFLers yourself, how do you feel about the extra 17th game added to this year's schedule? And how will it affect these guys, in your opinion, going throughout the year? So they added a game? I didn't even know that. But yeah. uh, did they take any preseason games away? No. Nope. Oh, two. Okay. two, two. I think okay. they either took uh, one yeah. game away or they took two games away. But I think it's one game they took away. I'd rather have an extra – Season game because you get paid your season money. Preseason games, you you only get paid a little bit of money. Right. I don't know what is it four hundred or it used to be four hundred seven hundred bucks yeah. a week. Whatever the hell it was. By the end of by the end of mine, it was twelve hundred dollars for a preseason game. Yeah. So I'd much rather play a regular season game and get my get my regular season paycheck. Yeah. And as far as the body, I, I, it's one more game. I mean, it's another week to rest. You you come out Monday, you get uh, bumps and bruises. You go to the training room. Tuesday's off. Wednesday, you come in. None of these guys are going full speed on Wednesday anyway. When Mac played, they used to beat the living crap out of each other. Oh, yeah. It was nonstop. It was full pads. They never went shorts, you know? These guys are hitting four games a week. It was a miracle they could make it through the year sometimes. So when we're in Green Bay with Mike Holmgren and we'd come play the uh, Chicago Bears when Thayer and Hilgi and all those guys are still on there. They'd be telling me nightmare stories on how Wanstad still had him going full go. And we're laughing. We're going full go. Uh, we got rid of yeah. that 12 weeks ago. So yeah, I don't think I even sweated when I was with Holmgren up there. Right. Great. Never broke a sweat with Mike. Mike took care of you. He practiced yeah. fast. He always asked you to practice fast. But do not beat the crap out of each other. Yeah, that's what I liked about him. He, he, you know, he got our work in, and then he just – you guys are on your own for your conditioning. You know, do what you got to do to – to stay to in be, shape, so. Yeah, to be fit. And if you weren't fit in a game, who come the next week, they'd find a way to make you fit to remind you that it's your responsibility. <laughs> Yerk, I got one more question before we cut you loose and before we start yeah, our before I'm we ready. start our yeah, I know, I know you're ready to get the hell out of here and throw back a few. I gotta go stuff. drinking. I'm out Yeah, exactly. Bar. I know, I know, I know you're ready to throw back a few ice cold ones, man. I know, I know, I know your game. I know yep. your game. Like I said, you got me too drunk last week. It's all your fault. I have, That's a good thing. It's all your fault. All right. How, what, what's what's the reason that you never came here to Chicago? What's the reason? Come on. Give me, oh, give well, me listen, the they had too many guys come that on. were like me. Mike oh, Wells come was on. here. I'm telling come you. What's, what's the reason that you never Mike came Wells here to Chicago? Mike Wells and Jim Flanagan were here. And when Dick Tron took over, I talked to Dick. And Dick goes, he goes, Yerk, he goes, I don't know what to do. He says, I, what you give me is the same stuff I get out of Mikey Walls and Jimmy Flanagan get, uh, brings the pass rush. And I told them, I said, hey, I appreciate it. And then Chris Palmer was in Cleveland. So I went over to Cleveland and uh, finally made two commas. I mean, it was an absolute miracle. I didn't know what that check looked like. I almost cried. I go, look, one comma, zero, 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 comma, zero, zero, zero. I about broke down. But no, that's the reason. Uh, my brother was drafted here in 1992 or 1991. He was taken in the ninth round by Coach Ditka. So my brother was a, a bear. He was on IR. He knew all the guys and had some fun. Uh, you know, so he got a chance to go ahead and suit up and put a Bears helmet on. It just wasn't going to work for me. Hey, listen, it worked out fine for me. Went down to Miami. They kept me on the practice squad. Went up to Green Bay. They kept me on. They cut me. They kept me on the practice squad. Then I got a break and I got a chance and an opportunity. That's all that matters. You got a chance. You got an opportunity. You establish it. You found a way to make it. And I stuck around for 10 years. I don't give a rat's patootie where I played as long as I played. And it worked out that way for me. And 10 years and a couple injuries. And I feel like crap every single day now. But it was worth it. Every single moment was worth it. And I wouldn't change a thing, especially going to Eastern Illinois University, the cradle of quarterbacks. All we do is produce quarterbacks. 
Romo, <laughs> Garoppolo, Sean Payton. That's all we do is produce quarterbacks. <laughs> well, I know that all you're right, guys. Loved, it's I know you're loved everywhere you've been, Yurko, and thank yeah. you so much for joining us. All right, Jimmy, good tonight. to see you, kid. Yurko, good to see you, brother. It's good to always. bring it back, bud. Right. Thanks, Yurko. All right. All right. So, John Yurkovich coming on with us. Jim, that was crazy, man. I'm sorry, man. I didn't mean to. <laughs> that, that was nuts. Yurko's, Yurko's a hell of a guy, man. He just kind of throws himself wherever he wants to go, I guess. I'm sure you know that. Oh, but uh, right? I mean, Yurko, he tells it like it is. That's the way you're supposed to do it. Exactly. Yurko's great people. So, Jim, before we get started, which you're really quick, man, I apologize. But I do have to take a quick little break. All right. Before we start get, getting into the nitty gritty with you, this uh, this interview with uh, with Jim McMahon is brought to you by Nick and Ivy Brewing Company, guys. And make sure you guys listen to this interview coming up next because it's going to be great. So here we go. Hello. This is Paul from Nick and Ivy Brewing Company. We are located at 1026 South State Street in historic downtown Lockport, Illinois. We are very excited to be partnering up with the Fat Mike Chicago Sports Show as well as the 1252 brand because we are one of the few Chicagoland breweries that embrace sports and sports culture. Come in for a fresh brewed beer made right here in Lockport while catching the game of your favorite team. Stay for the live music that we have booked every weekend or just come for a cozy atmosphere to enjoy a good conversation with a friend, loved one, or complete stranger. Nick and Ivy makes you feel right at home no matter what the occasion is. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook by searching for Nick and Ivy Brewing Company. Visit our website for our up-to-date tap list or to go shopping on our online store at nickivybrewing.com. That's N-I-K-I-V-Y brewing.com. Come in today for a fresh brewed beer born and raised in Lockport, Illinois. Right, so we're back. We're back here. Quick little word from our sponsor over at Nick and Ivy Brewing Company. Jim, I appreciate you hopping on with us a little bit early, talking with John Yurkovich. That was awesome. Reliving the old days, man. That, that that That's pretty crazy. I love it. It was pretty fun. It was pretty fun having both you guys on here with us. Yeah, so, he was a fun teammate. Fun teammate. He's a character, is he not? He's a character. That's for damn sure. That That's for damn sure. This guy last week we were over at um we were at the points bet uh sports book on um, Crestwood and this guy man uh, he's an animal he's an, he, he's an animal uh, that's the best way I can describe him is that he is an absolute animal Jim was he like that back in the day over in Green Bay yeah pretty much I mean he hasn't changed much and that's that's why everybody loves him he's 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 who he is all the time and that's that's why we got along well too. <laughs> Jim, I appreciate you coming on with us tonight. I really do. Thanks, thanks for coming on the Fat Mike Chicago Sports Show. It's this is this is one of the moments that I've always dreamed of in my lifetime interviewing you. I never thought that I'd be here in this chair right now interviewing the the Super Bowl winning quarterback of the nineteen eighty five Bears. That was I wasn't even alive to witness. To be honest with you, all right, I'm a young cat, man. I'm only thirty three. I just turned thirty three. But what was it like being a part of that 1985 Chicago Bears team for you, especially because you were a kid yourself during that time? What was it? What was it like being a part of that 1985 Chicago Bears Super Bowl run? Well, it was it was great being a part of you know from '82 on. I mean, just we started. Uh, we weren't very good when I first got there. I mean, '82, right. '83, we sucked. And uh, well, thank God there was a strike in '82. We only had to play nine games, so. Uh, the next year we, we weren't very good early on. I think we won seven of the last eight to finish eight and eight back in 83. And then uh, we just started rolling from there. 84, we, you know, we knew we were going to be pretty good. And then, uh, you know, we ended up in an NFC championship game in 84. Uh, and then in 85, we, you know, we just, you know, all, all we had to do was just stay healthy. You know, everybody, you know, I, I was, I missed four or five games in that season. And Steve Fuller came in, did a great job, and and uh, but it was just a, a great feeling to be, you know, part of that group that was that sucked, and now now we're the best team in the league. What was it like being a part of, especially in that season? I'm sure that you, I'm sure that you get a lot of these questions like this in the 1985 that Super Bowl season with that spectacular defense. But I'm not worried about the defense at all. What was it like being a teammate with Walter Payton? Because, I mean, this guy is like 
tried and true to my heart. I've watched highlights of, the, of you and him all the time. What was it like being a teammate with Walter Payton? Well, it was a, a treasure for me and everybody else. Uh, the guy was just a great football player. Uh, he could do it all. You know, he could run, he could throw, he could block, he could kick. Uh, you know, he was just a just an incredible athlete. And he had he had a hell of a desire not to be tackled. You know, he did not like to be tackled. Well, he would he would throw a bone on anybody close to him, man. But uh, my first my first couple of years, I remember I'd hand him the ball. And I'd watch him make a 30 yard run that only gained about two yards because he was just bouncing off guys left and right. And just, you know, I, I had to get out of the way a lot of times because, you know, you go one way, then you have to come back the other way. And uh, it was just a, a pleasure to play with. Never said anything in the huddle. You know, it's never said, give me the ball, you know, none, none of the stuff like that. But he would just, he just did his job. And uh, it was a lot of fun to, to watch. Angelo, go ahead. Uh, so I was going to ask you, Jim, what during that 85 season, you guys obviously only lost one game. I know the Super Bowl was is everybody's favorite game, but what was your favorite regular season moment during that, that season? Uh, game or moment, anything like that that, that you, kind of stands out to you? Oh, well, a lot early on it was the the Minnesota game. You know, it was the third game of the season, and and uh, I think we were both two and zero, oh, and uh, you know things weren't going well up there that night. And uh, I was bug, bugging Mike to put me in pretty much the whole first half, and then uh, he finally agreed to do it in the second half. And and to this day, I know it's just to get me out of his head because I was I was all over him. For, you know two hours in that first half and then at halftime, I said, Hey, I can play. And, you know, he had a rule that said that uh, if you didn't practice, you don't get to play, but that rule only applied to me. It seemed like because everybody else got to you know miss, miss a day or two and, and go ahead and play anyway. But uh, yeah, that, that game stands out. And then, you know, the rest of the season, I mean, just uh, the way, way things uh, eventually unfolded. And like I said, I missed four or five games in the middle of the year. And, uh, you know, our defense started playing, you know, outstanding. They were they were struggling early on. I mean, we had to save them the first, you know, we're playing Tampa Bay. I remember in the opener, we're down 14 points or something at halftime to Tampa. They were terrible. And, uh, you know, so we, we bailed them out a couple times early in the season. But once they got their stride, I mean, hell, they were they were fun to watch. So I uh, bringing it back to that 85 season, like you just kind of alluded to there, Jim. You and Mike didn't. You and uh, let me rephrase that. You and Mike Ditka didn't get along very well. Well, what's the story behind it? How, how come you guys didn't get along? What what, what what was the deal? I don't think it was that we couldn't get along. Is that we didn't agree on uh, on certain certain ways of, of getting you know a victory. You know, he he thought he was an offensive coordinator, and uh, he was by far an offensive coordinator. He was a tight end. When he played, he was a great tight end. I would love to play with him. Uh, but he called plays like a tight end. I mean, he would send stuff in. That just, I was like, wow, where'd that come from? And, uh, thank God the guys in, the, in my huddle understood that I knew the game. I understood the game. And I, I understood, you know, what, what we were trying to do. And, uh, you know, so whatever play I called, they were going to block it no matter what. And, and uh, you know, we, 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 had, we had a lot of laughs in the huddle. <laughs> The play would come in, and I'd say, "Well, hell, we're not going to call that." And we get some chuckles, but uh, and then I'd say, "Hey, you better make this other one work." It's, my ass is on the line here. But, <laughs> they always, they always had my back, and they, uh, you know, they played hard for me. I got one, Mike. If you're, yeah. So the infamous uh, Pete Rosell headband, uh, as you can see, I wore a headband in honor of you tonight. Uh, most people in Chicago know that story, but. For those of them who don't know, would you mind uh, going a little in depth on on what led to you wearing the Roselle headband? Well, I've been wearing a headband for a couple of years. I, I think since I got in the league, I was wearing a headband. And then Adidas came out with a headband. I think in it might have been in '84 or '85, early on. And I, I'd worn it all year long, and uh, never got a word or or a letter or anything from the commissioner or the league about about the headband. And so. Uh, I get fined in our playoff game, the first first playoff game I wore it, and I got a $5,000 fine. And uh, 
I was wondering why I got that fine. And I found out later I, I shouldn't have been able to be fine because it, they just made it up. <laughs> and, uh, and so at and $5,000 was a lot of money for me back then. I was playing for Chicago, you know, I wasn't, wasn't very, very highly paid. So, uh, I couldn't afford another fine. And so the, the very next week I wore the, uh, I wore the Adidas one all through the pregame warm up. But then it, it, we, you go in right before the, the kickoff there for that five minutes or whatever it is. And I'm thinking, you know, what, what can I put on my head? I wanted to put something else in front of Roselle, but I couldn't fit it all on there. So I've decided I'll just put his name on there and see what happens. And uh, when I came out, everybody saw that. I remember John Madden laughing his ass off. <laughs> Uh, I didn't get fined that week. I got a I got a phone call from Pete saying, "Hey, thank you for the free advertising." And uh, I said, "You guys are making a big stink about this, and it's not you know it's nothing in the rule book that says I can't wear this." But I found out it was you know Adidas wasn't paying the NFL at that time, and that's why they took it out on me. I said, "That's not my problem." You know, right. you know I've been wearing this, I've been wearing this Adidas since I got into this league, and nobody's had a problem with it. But now all of a sudden we're in the playoffs; it's a big deal. And so in the Super Bowl, <coughs> you know, I decided I was going to wear uh, all charities. Figured if they sign, if they right. find me for charities, they're going to look like idiots. And so uh, Adidas offered me a lot of money at that time to to wear the suit, to wear the headband. And I said, okay, I'll wear it, but it might not be on my head because I had gotten a hold of the rule book and realized these guys are screwing with me. And I'm going to get them back. And so. Uh, all during the pregame warm up again during the Super Bowl, I, I wore the Adidas headband, and the head referee kept chasing me around, saying, hey, "I can't let you on the field." And I said, "Yeah, I know." And then, uh, as soon as the anthem was over, I'm standing next to Walter, myself, the head referees by me. And as soon as the anthem was over, I went to put my helmet on, and he he grabbed me and said, "I cannot let you on the field." And I said, "I know, but you can't do shit about this." And I pulled it down around my neck, and you see the picture that I have in the in the Super Bowl. You can see Adidas very clearly. And he, the ref just started laughing at me. He goes, yeah, you're right. I can't. And so I took the first uh, headband. I think it was JDF or Ju Juvenile Diabetes and put that on. And then uh, every series after that, I changed to a new charity and, and uh, things worked out great. You know, I ended, awesome. up with, uh, you ended up with Pluto. And, you know, the, 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 and I remember the announcer saying, oh, this guy's out in outer space now because I had Pluto on my head. Right. It was a tribute to a, a college teammate of mine who was actually with the Bears in 83 when they found his brain tumor. Right. And then uh, he had just gone through his second surgery probably a couple of weeks before that Super Bowl. So I was just letting him know that I was I was thinking about him. And unfortunately, uh, he just passed away like three weeks ago. And uh, but he lasted a long time after that uh, tumor. So he had a good life and uh, was a little rough speaking at his funeral. But uh, he was a lot of fun to be around. That's for sure. And Jim, that's one thing that that you definitely did do. You went through like what three or four different headbands during the Super Bowl with that, especially uh, helping out your buddy, like you said, wearing Pluto on your headband. What was it? I mean, what was it like dealing with that moment? What was? I mean, what you just didn't give a shit, or what? Like you just wanted to do what you wanted to do and do exactly what you wanted to get done across the board. Well, I've always wanted to live my life the way I want to live my life. And right. I, I've always pretty much done that. So, no, I, I figured the, the headbands, I just wanted to, like I said, get back at them for, for finding me, for one. Right. Or calling me out for something I didn't do wrong. Right. Uh, I just wanted to, you know, bring attention to the fact that, hey, these guys are just messing with me. I'm going to get back at them. So I, I ended up getting paid and didn't didn't get fined. But the, the, the moment you're talking about, you know, being in that in that Super Bowl, uh, I don't really remember a lot about that game. Uh, you probably don't. I don't know if you know the story that I was getting death threats because uh, some idiot reporter. Yes. You know, went on television and said that I had called all the women of New Orleans sluts and, and the men mm -hmm. stupid. And, and uh, you know, where this came from. Oh, I know where it came from now, but how that how that came about, I don't know. I mean, we had no curfew for the whole week. And so we we saw the sun come up there on Bourbon Street a couple of days, and and one of these days happened to be this morning. It was uh, it was a Thursday morning. I remember it clearly. I, the phone rang. I don't know, probably six o'clock, and we just laid down. And uh, 
somebody's just cussing me up and down. I'm like, what the hell? And I, I hang up. 30 seconds later, phone rings again. It's somebody else it's doing the same thing. And my roommate, Kurt Becker, is like, hey, who, what's going on? I said, I don't know, but somebody's pissed off at me. You know, I, there's people saying they're going to kill me, this and that. So I, I go down to the team breakfast, and uh, our GM at the time, uh, Jerry Venisi, walks up to me, and all he says was, oh, you really did it this time. And he walked away. And I, so now I got I got fans screaming at me. I got Jerry pissed. I don't I still don't know what the hell I did. And then Ditka walked up to me. I'm still in the food line, right? And uh, he said, "Did you really say that?" And I said, "Mike, say what?" I said, "I got people waking me up this morning. Jerry's pissed. What the hell did I say?" And he said, "Did you really call all the women of New Orleans sluts and, and the men stupid?" I go, "What are you talking about?" I go, even if I thought that was true, I'd never say it, I, I, not to, especially to a reporter. <laughs> and he says, well, supposedly he did the radio show this morning. And I said, what time? He said, six o'clock. I said, dude, we didn't get back here till 530. I said, I'm not getting up at six o'clock for some damn radio show. And so I, I denied it all. It was all. It was all made up. I don't know where the guy, you know, where he got that information from. But uh, yeah, so the rest of the week I was getting, you know, women were picketing the hotel. Uh, you know, there was death threats or I was still getting death threats. It was a bomb threat on Saturday morning. Uh, I remember the wives, the wives all came down on Friday. And so I was staying at my wife's hotel and I was walking back to our hotel and there's a bunch of cops and firemen and everything. And I'm like, Oh hell, they blew up. My, <laughs> I thought they blew up Becker. And I said, Hey, what, what the hell's going on? They go, yeah, there's a bomb threat again. I'm like, Oh, so yeah, I was again. thinking about all again. I was thinking about. I like how you say again, again. There's a bomb threat again. Well, yeah, like I said, I, <laughs> for the next four days, I was getting all kinds of uh, of threats, and and we practiced at the old Saints, uh, New Orleans Saints facility, which which uh, there was an old apartment complex that looked or overlooked that whole practice field, and so nobody really wanted to be around me at practice. They thought they were going to catch a stray. <laughs> And, you know, I wore a different jersey just so, you know. But uh, it worked out all right. And as soon as, the, as soon as that game ended, my ass ran to the locker room. I didn't stick around the field. I got to the locker room, got showered, and I got out of town. You weren't, you weren't waiting around, huh? No, no. I was – well, actually, I, I stayed overnight, and we left. Uh, I was actually going to the Pro Bowl the next day. So I, I stayed, and uh, I, would, I wish now I would have went back to the, for the parade. I saw the parade on TV. And uh, it was it was unbelievable. That, that's the, my biggest regret of, of after winning the Super Bowl is not going back to Chicago for that parade. Uh, it was it was nice to be a part of it, but uh, I know the bar, our boys are freezing their butt off. I mean, everybody was, <laughs> they weren't ready for that cold standing up on top of those buses. I'll tell you that. But uh, that was say it was an incredible scene. So, Jim, after after your 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 tenure here in Chicago, there was a trade that happened, and you were traded to San Diego. Give us a little bit of insight on exactly what the hell happened, because I, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, you should have been the Chicago Bears quarterback going forward for a long time coming. All right, but that's just my that that's my opinion. Okay, I'm I'm, I'm going to back off on this. I want to hear your opinion. What exactly happened here? Well, I think after my, uh, I was asked to write a book in '85, uh, summer of '85, and uh, I didn't didn't say very nice things about the owner. I think that was the biggest reason. Uh, I think they wanted to trade or trade me in '86 and '87 and '88, but I don't think Dick had felt that he had somebody that could, you know, that he could go to the war with. So. They stayed, I stuck around for another three years uh, after the Super Bowl. So, but uh, yeah, it was. I think that's that's what it was. You know, the owner was not. I wasn't real high on the owner. He wasn't real high on me. So, uh, I was kind of glad to get out. And plus, Dick and I weren't getting along at, at all. Uh, things got, you know, pretty ugly there towards the end. So, uh, it was time to go. I would have loved to to stay in Chicago. My family, all my kids were raised in Chicago. I, I stayed there. You know. With, Whatever team I was played for, I, I was always coming back in the off season. Uh, yeah, I lived there 28 years. Yeah, I loved the place. Would have would have loved to to finish my career there, but uh, you know things just didn't work out the way they you know sometimes should. 
I, I know Jimmy said you don't watch the uh, the product as much anymore. Mike and I have battled this or batted this question around why the Bears have struggled so much to get a quarterback. It, is it that difficult to diagnose that position? Is that why they struggle, or do you just think it's just ineptitude? I think it's usually it's the system. Yeah, I mean, uh, that was the worst offense I'd ever played in when I was in Chicago. It was boring as hell. It was, uh, you know, I think what they have now is a hell of a system. I'd love to be you know, playing in that with you. You get all those weapons you got. They have right now, or they seem to have. They seem to have a lot of speed. Uh, sorry, guys. That's okay. No, you're good, Jim. You're good. Um, but where was I? Yeah, was this? What was I just talking about? Uh, about the system that they were on right yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. I think that's you know the Chicago's always been known for their defense, right? Yeah. Their defense and their running game, and that's probably all they're ever going to be known for. <laughs> Uh, it's, I think it's where quarterbacks go to die. I mean, yeah. not- you aren't shitting me, Jim. <laughs> Jesus uh, Christ, man! Don't get me even started on Mike. Like, you're you're the last fucking good Chicago Bear quarterback that we've had. <laughs> All right, and the, the, you and Jay Cutler are the cream of the fucking crop here. Okay, I'll let you continue. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I apologize, Jim. Mike, Mike gets no heated with the, I'm with the quarterback pissed, situation. I'm getting pissed off because you said it. All right, and I'm t- I'm I'm a Bears fan at heart, and it just it it pisses me off. It pisses me off. Mike, Mike, and I have spent countless hours on this show, starting in a good mood, and then discussing the Bears quarterback situation, and it just completely goes 180. So uh, he he, you know, he doesn't. A lot, they they get a lot of blame. A lot of it, you know, some of it they deserve, but uh, you know, somebody's got to be able to take you know take control of the game. You know, you don't right. let the coach, right. you don't let the coach control what the hell you're doing on the field. Right. That's what practice is all about. You know, they they can give you some, you know, some advice during practice, but during the game, come on, leave me the hell alone. I know what I'm doing. Right. Uh, I, I know what, <laughs> I know how to get things done, and. Uh, you know, I think a lot of guys, they, they don't, you know, they'll call whatever play is called and, and deal with it and and then say after the game, oh, the coach called that play. You know, there, there's, always a, there's always a fallback position. I didn't care. You know, if I screwed up, yeah, I say, yeah, I, I messed that up. But, uh, you know, I'm going to do I'm going to do it my way. Now, whether – and I want to help a lot more than I lost. So. That's, that's, yeah, that's what I was just going to say is I, it feels like – the, the great quarterbacks have that same mentality where it's like, okay, yeah, the coach is the coach, but on the field, that's my domain. That's where I make my money. That's where the flow of the game goes through me. So that's what we're going to do. Like look at guys like Aaron Rodgers, right? Or Tom Brady, they can read the field. And, and I feel like that's what the bears have lacked is somebody with that kind of mojo or, you know, attitude to just kind of want to take over the game instead of just being like a yes man type of player. So so, uh, Jim, I, I I know that you've I know that you kind of sort of watch of watch a little bit of the Chicago Bears. Um, how did you feel about the Bears draft and moving up to draft Mitchell Trubisky at two? That's just typical Bear draft move. <laughs> <laughs> Please you know, elaborate. They could have, uh, from what I was hearing, they could have got him in the second or third round. And there, there was other guys out there. It wasn't Mahomes there, and uh, and Deshaun Watson. Watson, uh, yeah, there was other guys that, you know, I guess that uh, they could have gotten, but that's that's the Bears. I don't, I don't know how I got to the Bears. Well, I do because I was supposed to go to the Baltimore Colts. Uh, they were Colts were still in Baltimore when I was coming out in '82, and uh, all indications were. That I was going to Baltimore. I was. I had two or three trips back to Baltimore. I'm having lunch and dinner with Johnny Unitas at his restaurant. He's telling me how great the city is, this and that. And so, uh, you know, draft day. I'm thinking I'm going to Baltimore. They pick number four. And uh, I had forgotten. I had told my agent I didn't want to play in Baltimore. And so he he remembered that. And then uh, Baltimore at the time was had a running back. I believe it was Curtis Dickey. Uh, from Texas A&M, that they were having trouble signing. And uh, so my agent told them, don't even bother drafting me because they'll never sign me. They can't even sign Curtis. So 
and that's what happened on draft day. So when they when the you know number four pick came, and I'm thinking, all right, here I go. I got to go to Baltimore, and they they ended up taking uh, Art Schleister from Ohio State. I remember the year? You guys even remember that name or know that name? Yeah, I've heard the name. I've heard ended the up name. in prison for gambling or something. I don't know. Yep. Yeah. But uh, I was like, "Wow, what happened there?" And then, and then the phone rings right after, and I'm I'm coming to Chicago. But uh, the only thing I knew about Chicago was that my folks uh, met in Chicago. They were both stationed there during the uh, Korean War. Uh, they were both in the military, and uh, and I I'd, I'd seen the movie Brian Song. That's it. That's all I knew about Chicago. <laughs> and uh, you know, the next thing you know, I'm there for 28 years. You know, loved it. Used to used to love this. Uh, I don't know what's happened to it now. <laughs> so, how how do you feel about this this young buck Zach Wilson out of your alma mater, uh, wearing the headbands just like you doing doing the Jim McMahon thing out of BYU? How do you feel about this kid? Is this kid a stud or what? Well, speaking with Tommy Homo, who's the athletic director there at BYU, he was a teammate of mine at BYU as well, played for the 49ers. Uh, he told me uh, two years ago, he goes, yeah, this kid's pretty special. And so I'm sure he's going to do well. Um, you know, he's got the, he's got all the skills. You know? It all depends on where you go. You know, if you go to a team that's got a good system, you got a chance to do some things. But if you go to a team that like it used to be in Chicago, then – you better hope you're a good third and long <laughs> thrower. <laughs> uh, so uh, we had a we had a question in the chat. Somebody wants to know what it was like getting to hang out with Michael Jordan. Oh, MJ was fun. Yeah, he's still fun. He's just uh, you know he's very very competitive guy. You know he wants to bet at everything. But uh, yeah, he's he's he was a lot of fun. Yeah, I haven't seen him in a while. I haven't, I haven't uh, actually probably last year up in uh, Lake Tahoe. He was up there last year. I don't even remember, but I usually see him up there at least once a year. Nice. But uh, yeah, it was fun. You know, we played a lot of golf together. You know, I had him at my house. We played pool. Uh, he's a damn good pool player too. But you know, it, everything's got to be for money. So <laughs> it doesn't matter if it's a dollar or, or, or a million. You know, he wants to he wants to bet you. But uh, yeah, he's he's a good time. So I, I got a question from one of our sponsors here, Jim. His his name is Paul Ivnick, and he 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 owns Nick and Ivy Brewing Company out here in in uh, the Lockport uh, the Lockport area, south of south of Chicago. He said he used to work there as a caddy. <laughs> he used to work at Butler National as a Butler National Golf Course as a caddy. Um, and, and in the late two thousands. There was a rumor. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna go like this. Okay, I'm gonna go rumor. All right, that 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 Jim McMahon golfs barefooted and gave caddies weed to smoke as as they were for caddying for him, and he also took a piss in the Butler National Pond. Is this a true <laughs> statement? <laughs> I need to know uh, this because I'm an avid golfer. Uh, and I would say did, everything, yes, except for the piston in the pond because I don't remember that, but I might have. <laughs> I, I need you to drink know. a lot of beer on the course. You got to go somewhere. So. You got to go somewhere, <laughs> whether it be a tree or a pond. Who gives a shit, right? Pond, pool, doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> You're the man, Jim. I appreciate it, dude. I Because I, I'm an avid golfer, and I know like when I'm on the course, Listen, dude. It, it's a, a minimum eighteen beers. Eighteen beers minimum. Oh, well, that's All the way right. it should be. Beer hall. <laughs> beer well, that's hall. the way I used to play. You know, beer hall, then two exactly. on the par fives. See, it and sounds then, like you and I need to go golfing sometimes. Smoke a bowl about every two or three holes. Yeah, that's good. right. <laughs> it sounds like you and I need to go golfing sometimes. So, so Jim, outside, outside, of, outside of the smoke and a bowl and hanging out on the golf course. All right. How are you feeling outside of football? How, how's everything going for you personally? There's been a bunch of a, you, you've done a couple <laughs> interviews with ESPN and stuff like that about how you're feeling outside of football. How are you feeling personally right now? Are you are you good? Are you ready to rock and roll? Are you can you can you go down and golf in uh, another eighteen with us and in in, in, uh, in on August fourteenth? Can you come on out here and golf another fourteen? <laughs> well, I'll look into that. But uh, as far as my 
my body, my body feels a hell of a lot better. My head still bugs me uh, quite a bit. I've got to go see the guy in New York about every three months. Uh, in fact, the last time I saw him, he said it's the worst he'd seen my neck in, in you know, the eight years that he's been treating me. Uh, yeah, it just every once in a while, I'll either sleep wrong or bump my head and just it's it's not good for a while. But uh, I actually went down to Medellin, Colombia two years ago and got 275 million stem cells shot into my body. So my, my shoulders, my elbows, my knees, uh, my right shoulder is still, my, my right shoulder hasn't been good since high school. So that still bugs me, but the rest of my body actually feels pretty damn good for you know the 18 or 19 surgeries that I had. And you started, you, started, you started a really good thing with Jeremy Roenick. Can you elaborate on that for us a little bit, please? You started a really cool thing with Jeremy Roenick. Give us a little bit of insight on that. Well, it's just a group called Players Against Concussions, and uh, it's just basically to bring more awareness uh, to the younger people about, you know, wearing helmets when you ride a bike or, you know, tie your shoelaces. I mean, just, just simple just simple thing because it doesn't take a big knock on the head or a big hit to, to really screw up your brain. I mean, you just fall the wrong way or, or you just bump your head the wrong way and you could be a vegetable. I mean, it's, it's that, it's that uh, severe. And so we're just trying to bring more awareness and, uh, you know, stuff like that. If you do get, you know, dinged when you're, when you're younger and you're playing in high school or whatever it is, and, uh, you ring your bell, you know, let somebody know, you know, don't, you know, we, Everybody back, you know, when I played it, you know, you got to be tough. You got to tough it out. You know, tape an aspirin to your helmet. Your, hell, your headache will go away. You know, stuff like that. Uh, but you, you just have to be a little, little more smart uh, the way you do things, and uh, you, know, you, you can be fine. Jim, hey, was, boys, we're gonna have to wrap this up pretty soon because I've, yeah, I've actually yeah, got no, plans. We're so wrapping it up right now. We're wrapping more it up minutes right would be great. Yeah, no, we're wrapping it up right now, Jim. I appreciate you coming on with us. Thank you so much for your time. I really do appreciate it. It was just kind of like a a, a weird a weird uh, segment there because uh, you know you and John Yurkovich kind of you know you guys know each other and stuff like that. I wanted to get you guys introduced again. It would be fun, but I appreciate you coming on with us, Jim. It's been awesome. Thank you so much again. Like this is I, I I've been waiting for this day since you know the day I was born almost. Because I don't remember you. You know what I mean? I don't remember you winning the Super Bowl for the Chicago Bears. I don't remember that. Um, yeah, my, youngest, my, my, my dad was super jealous. Either. My youngest son has just turned 30, and uh, he was he was around when we were with the Packers. So he's he's always been a Packer fan because it's all he oh, remembers. that's terrible. That's terrible. And, uh, you got to switch yeah. him immediately. Jim. He likes to see the old the old tapes and the old you know all the old things I used to do. So. So yeah, my, uh, my dad was super jealous when I told him I was uh, getting a chance to sit down and talk with, with the Super Bowl winning Jim McMahon. So he was, Jim. One last question. Right now, as you sit, I know that you know you you do your own thing. <laughs> Who do you root for in the NFL right now? Who's your team? Uh, well, like I said, I'm, I'm really not a fan. I'm, I like uh, Andy Reid because I've I've known Andy Reid with the Kansas City Chiefs for. Uh, I met Andy in 1977. He was at Brigham Young as well. And uh, I got to play with him. And then he was also on the staff in Green Bay when I was there. I was very impressed with his, his coaching abilities. And then and what he's done as a head coach is, is, is phenomenal. And so, uh, yeah, I, I, I always check in to see how he's doing. And uh, you know, Ron Rivera, obviously, uh, was a teammate as well. Uh, Leslie Frazier, I think, still doing a hell of a job up in Buffalo. So yeah, I just check on and see how see how my old teammates are doing. But uh, as far as sitting down and watching the game, put me down for a no. Put you down for a no. What are you doing in your free time? You watching golf? What's 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 the, what's going on in Jim McMahon? Jim I McMahon. actually I did not see any of the Masters last week. Oh come on, Jim! It was a good not Masters. one not one shot did I see. I was actually oh. I just got back from. Uh, there was an event out at uh, Pebble Beach. We got to play Spyglass Pebble in uh, Spanish Bay. Uh, just got home uh, the other day. I was Richard Dent had, had, was actually at the tournament, and I saw that his team won the net event. So I said, "Damn, he must have forgot a couple shots again somewhere." But <laughs> Jim, yeah, that's all I'm doing. Just playing, playing a lot of golf here and there, and uh, just relaxing, dude. Jim, I tell you what, we got a we got a really kick ass golf tournament going on here August 14th over at over here at um, Water's Edge Golf Course out in Worth, Illinois. 
uh, Worth, Illinois. And I would love for you to be here. I'll fly you on out. Let's hang out. Let's golf. I'll even let you go barefoot. And I'll tell you what, you can hang out with Fat Mike and Angelo. We'll ride the cart together. We'll have a good time. And I'll tell you what, I got, I, I have the goods on the wacky tobacco. Yet. I got the goods yeah. on the wacky tobacco. Yeah. Uh, we'll see so, who's is better. Oh, <laughs> come on, man. Come on. It'll be a fun time. Jim, thank you so much for joining us, man. It's been a pleasure. And honestly, it's thank been an you. an honor. So right, guys. much, dude. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jim. I really do appreciate right. it. It's been care, fucking awesome. Thank you so much, Jim. I'll talk to you soon, my friend. Jim McMahon, dude. This guy is a fucking this guy is a king. And yeah. so this guy the, the king of Chicago here. Yeah, it was uh when I told my dad that we were gonna have a chance to sit down with him, uh he was he was pretty jealous. That's been my dad's like, uh, my dad used to, I think I've told this story before. My dad used to drive limos down in the city. Right. And so he picked up, you know, all kinds of guys, athletes and that kind of stuff. And Jim was always somebody that he loved. I mean, we talked about it tonight. The only quarterback to to win a Super Bowl for the Bears in the last, I mean, how long ago was 85? 30 something years ago? 30, well, 36 years ago. Yeah, 36 years ago. So, yeah. I mean, and look at that team. That team, everybody on that team still lives a, a, in this allure of legendary status, you know, because right. no team has done it since. So, that's why if you're a quarterback out there and you're good, there was Chicago, plenty of... we will uh, we'll love you forever if you win a, world, yeah, a no Super shit. Bowl for us. There, there was plenty of stuff that I wanted to ask him that I didn't get the chance to ask him. All right, because I mean, honestly, I was kind of you know I went you a little fangirled like, out a little. I fangirled out a little bit. It's yeah, two exactly. weeks in a row. Two yeah, weeks. In two a weeks row. in a row. All right, I'm sorry. Okay, I got to straighten out. I know this is ridiculous. What do you want me to do? You want me to run for the Senate? All right, uh, you know, uh, if you guys know the movie Stripes, you guys get that reference. If not, then you guys can go fuck yourself. Okay, but like I honestly, we watching, I thought we were watching our cussing on the show. No, no, Jimmy. Sure. Man, Jim McMahon was honestly one of the coolest fucking interviews I've ever had in my entire life. All right. It was super badass. I love that you, that I love the fact that you're wearing a 1252 fucking headband. That is badass. All right. Represent Jim McMahon. I wore it specifically for him tonight. But like, no it. bullshit, dude. Like, no bullshit. It was badass having Jim McMahon on here talking mm-hmm. about the Mike Ditka era, talking about mm-hmm. him being traded to San Diego Chargers. All right, like that, I would have that, loved to have gotten a little more in depth on, on the Super Bowl game itself, but yeah, but know, I mean, we, we touched listen, on a we, few good topics. I like we, that we touched talked. on some shit that, that you know he probably doesn't talk about much. All right, right, you know, like everybody's talking about the fucking 85 86 Bears. Okay, I get it. Whoop de fucking do. We right, won. I feel like yeah, I feel like he gets that conversation everywhere. He goes, right, you know what I mean. We so. won, we won the fucking, we won, we won the Super Bowl thirty six fucking years ago. Okay. At this point, I don't give a flying frog's fat green ass. Okay. Until they do something now current, because that's what it boils down to. And Jimmy. And here's the thing. Hey, how soon is that going to be? Exactly. (laughs) It'll be another 36 years before that. You are 100% on point, man. This Bears team needs to buckle down and get their shit together and build a team. You and I have been talking about this. What over the last year and a half, we started week one last year on yeah. talking football with Tyler DeMouse Fantasy. All right, we we started this on talking football, which is our show on Sundays during the football season. During the football season, all right, and it's it's been nothing but the same thing every single week. All right, and Jim brought that per- to perspective today, where he's like, and this is Jim. Fucking McMahon, all right? The Super Bowl winning quarterback of the 1985 1986 Chicago Bears. He's just like, meh. Yeah, okay. <laughs> he's like, this was a terrible offense I, then. It's a terrible I offense even, now. I don't even watch it. Like, he's like, you know, the, the, like, he pretty much boiled it down to where, like, yeah, it's it's cool. You know, I, I, don't, I don't even, I don't, you know, it is what it is. Right. And that's sad to say for being the charter franchise of the NFL and being the Chicago I hate, Bears. I hate when people say, like, they throw that around, the charter franchise. Like, I understand, but, like, that only holds so much weight for so long. You know what I mean? Like, 
you've heard the stories. You listen to ESPN 1000. I do as well. You've heard the guys talk about that's what they hold their hat on is the history of the Chicago Bears franchise when in reality maybe it's time to make some new history and embrace that new history because I'm tired of seeing such inept football. Yeah, I mean, it's the same thing that, you know, I've been saying this since week one of last year, dude. I have been rooting adamantly against the Chicago Bears football team just to where they can have a high draft pick. Okay, like that that's where I've been. Angelo, you know this. All right. I don't want them to win fucking games. I, know. I don't want <laughs> I, I don't want them to be eight and eight. All right. I want them to suck ass and get a good pick <laughs> and draft a fucking predominant pro bowler for a chance. That's that's exactly what I want. And the, the mainstay the, the the main thing that I keep on alluding to back and forth, back and forth, is O-line. And you know this. That was one of my questions that I was going to ask him was, you know, he was part of the that 85 offense with Walter. And that they obviously that offense went through Walter Payton, right? That that was... Jesus, yes, definitely. Right, right. For sure. Without a doubt. I was going to ask his opinion on, on what's the most important piece on an offense. I wanted to know if he would say the quarterback or the O-line itself. I feel like he would have said O-line, but that's just, I I, I forgot to ask that question. Yeah. I mean, because I mean, look, look, Jim McMahon got his ass beat. Yeah. A lot in here in Chicago. All right. Like that's legit. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind no doubt in my mind that he got his ass beat here in Chicago. Okay. Like he, he took a lot of hits. Yeah. Okay. And one thing to move the rock, dude, you got to have a sufficient offensive line. Plain and simple. You got to have, you have to have an offensive line to move the ball. Right. Plain and simple to score points. You have to have an offensive line Mm -hmm. and that's where the bears are at now. I don't give a shit if it's Ross Perot out there fucking quarterbacking. This is just me just stating a random asshole, okay, moving the ball. All right. It doesn't matter who you have quarterbacking the football. You have to have a sufficient offensive line to be able to move the ball. Right. Plain and simple. Right. And, and you've seen that last year when the offensive line struggled for the Spares team. Especially with Nick Foles, you had such an immobile quarterback that he had no he a shot. Statue, right? And I don't want to go down the rabbit hole of the shitty Bears team because we do it every every time. It seems like every show I don't want to somehow talk about reverts it. back to this shitty Bears team. So before it gets to that, I say we thank the Coldwell Banker Group for yes. Jim McMahon, and then maybe wrap it up. Yes, definitely for sure. This was all brought to you by the John Darren team over at the Coldwell Banker Real Estate Group out in Homer Glen. And I thank these guys because this is awesome. Without these guys, we would be a bunch of nobodies. So, yeah, there you go. Somebody's talking. Hi, I'm Jonathan Darren, licensed real estate broker with Cobble Banker Real Estate Group in Homer Glen. Are you looking to buy or sell? Have you been disappointed in the past? The Jonathan Darren team with Cobble Banker Real Estate Group focuses on providing you with a concierge level of service during the process of buying or selling. We are a service oriented team with a fresh and professional approach to selling real estate. Our goal is to combine knowledge, skills, and passion to exceed our clients' expectations, and most of all, we truly care. We are a knowledgeable real estate team focused on offering expertise and innovative solutions for our clients. The Jonathan Darren team has five full-service real estate brokers and a dedicated full-time marketer servicing all of Chicagoland. We will customize a detailed plan around your timeline for a sale, purchase, investment, estate, or other needs. Real estate transactions can be stressful, but don't need to be. Let us handle it for you. Visit our website, homesbyjdt.com, or call 708 708- 308 1938 today. Expect better in real estate. Choose the Jonathan Darren team. And we're back. Thank you to the Jonathan Darren team over at Hold uh, over at Coldwell Banker Real Estate Group. Those guys are awesome. Thank you, especially to the Nick and Ivy Brewing Company who brought to you by uh, us. Yo, by I'm so excited to get out yes. there on Sunday for my first time. 
you know, Fred talks about them all the time. You talk about it all the time. I'm excited to go out there, have a couple drinks. It'll be a good time. Yes. And what you're speaking of is Sunday, this 18th. And what is it? Uh, four days, actually. And so on Sunday, April 18th, we are going to be doing a live show, remote show, at Nick and Ivy Brewing Company in Lockport, 1026 South State Street in Lockport, Illinois, hanging out, having beers, eating food, hanging out with Fred Hubner, David Schuster. It's going to be a good time. We got a raffle going. We got free food coming on. We got the best pizza in Lockport, Illinois. Manja's. Manja's Pizza, man. I'm telling you, this is the, this is the top of the line pizza place. And we got the best beer in town from Nick and Ivy. We're going to be hanging out there, having a live show, drinking beer, eating food, having a great time. There's nothing much. There's nothing more that you can ask for, man. There's nothing more you can ask for. Yeah, it's uh, I I enjoyed the last on location we did, uh, remote show that we we had. Um, the weather was pretty shit, so I'm hoping that the uh, yeah the weather Sunday is gonna hold up and be a little bit nicer out. We're doing an earlier show, so that that might help out too with maybe catching a little break in the weather, hopefully. But uh, we got a lot of good raffle items that are going to be out there. Yes, um, yes. Like you- we got Cubs tickets to give away. We have a uh, a fifty dollar gift card to tattoo Tattoo City. It's it's you know, listen, man. You want to get a Cubs tattoo? Boom, right there, right there. You get you get to go to the game. What and- if you won? Right. What if you won the Cubs tickets and the tattoo so you can go and get a 1252 tattoo right before you go to the cubs game solid solid plan right right on your forehead 1252 sports chicago right there be be a champ or you can just get a cool headband like me right well yeah i can get a cool headband i'm the headband um i don't know i was gonna come up with a cool nickname but it kind of fizzled out there at the end (laughs) i'm the headband but (laughs) Uh, yeah, that's kind of, <laughs> all right, let's wrap it up. No, yeah, great show tonight. Thank you especially to John Yerkovich from ESPN Chicago 1000 from the uh, from the Carmen and Yerko show, ESPN Chicago, ESPN 1000. Make sure you guys listen to those guys every Monday through Friday from 10 to noon. And then make sure you also hit up Jim McMahon, man. What the hell are you guys doing? You guys got to hit up Jim. Jim's good on, uh, dude. on Twitter. Uh, Daniel on Twitter, Greenberg. Daniel Facebook. Greenberg has become one of my favorite follows because he seems to really enjoy what we're doing on here. So yeah. it'll be uh, we got some some good Jim McMahon quotes on his Twitter. So definitely go and check that out too. All right, well, sounds good. So yeah, it's follow that guy, and fo- you know make sure you follow Jim McMahon. It was awesome. Thank you, especially to both of those guys tonight. Thank Not many you. people can say they had both those guys on the same show at the same time. I know, time. right? Dude, like, I got a little flustered having both of those guys on at the same time. It, it threw the mojo of the show off a little bit. It kind of fucked me up. It kind of fucked bit. me up. I'm not going to lie. I don't know if that's what fucked you up, but we'll, <laughs> we'll talk. <laughs> But, no, know, I'm good. I'm straight. Cool. I'm good. No, like it, it seriously, it kind of threw me off just, it a, did. just a tad bit. But it was also absolutely fantastic having both of those guys on at the same time Yeah, and yurko was super generous with his time yes he was super generous with his time, yes so. yes it was it was fantastic naked cribbage right so come on naked cribbage and uh, listen jim mcmahon pissed in the pond at a golf course <laughs> i mean look at that he, he doesn't remember it but he probably did it all right and he's giving caddies a bunch of weed i want a caddy for jim mcmahon that's what i want to do that that's that's my type of guy I, I want to hold his clubs and have him give me the give me the good old smoke, and we'll have we'll have a good old time. I'll, we got to make sure it. we uh we send the link to the guys too. They want to jump on after the show for a minute, for so sure. Let's uh let's get over to that. All right. So on that note, guys, thank you so much, and uh, thank you to Jim McMahon. Thank you to John Yerkovich. Thank you to the Nick and Ivy Brewing Company, and definitely thank you to the John Durin. Coldwell Banker Real Estate Group. You guys are the best. And uh yeah, we'll see you guys next week. We got a big we got another big show lined up for you guys on Sunday. Don't o'clock. miss Turtle Takes. There'll be more info on the uh the yes. live show for Don't Sunday. Don't miss Turtle Takes for Friday. And yeah, it's gonna be a good one. 
Bye. So on that note, Angela. Peace, I'll brother. see you on Friday. Yeah, probably. We're going we're going golfing Saturday, buddy. Oh, it's gonna be a fucking train wreck. But you're gonna suck, bro. <laughs> I've never golfed a day in my life. So you're, you're gonna I'm chunk so it. much. You're gonna chunk so much. It's gonna be awesome. All right, let's go before I go to sleep here. <laughs> All right, guys, thank you so much, and we will see you guys next week. You guys take care. Peace. Bye.